We're currently in the middle of a wave of filmmaking known as elevated horror. Given to films which supposedly, as the title suggests, use the conventions of the genre to explore themes that are traditionally deemed worthy of high art, the whole idea of the subgenre has been met with huge controversy in the worlds of film criticism and horror fandom alike. Not only is it a massively snobbish term, it's also just plain wrong. Horror has been exploring the profound for practically as long as it's been a genre. Like comedy, horror is a genre often defined just by its effect, the obvious reaction it gets from an audience. It's this means of classification which frequently lets things verge into the trashy, titillating or exploitative. Sex has become an integral part of many areas of horror cinema, inextricably linked with violence, gore and thrills. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one. You can never have sex. It's because of this deviation into the sensationalist that many write off horror cinema as a legitimate art form. But 2016's Raw and 2021's Titan, both directed by Julia de Corner, seem to have bridged the gap between these two contrasting views of the horror genre. Notorious for their explicit content, recalling the new French extremity movement, but equally garnering significant critical attention for their deeper themes and character portrayals. They remind modern audiences about the sheer power that horror as a genre has to elicit primal reactions while still analysing the human spirit. What's most remarkable about de Corno's handling of the genre is how she uses it to enhance the human story she tells, without sacrificing any of the genre's trappings or the story's more relatable elements. Raw and Titan are unquestionably body horror films. Despite the subgenre's cinematic origins and the work of David Cronenberg, director of films like The Brood and The Fly, the fundamental fear of bodily harm has been present in Western culture since at least the early 19th century, with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein directly dealing with the perversion of the natural order through the mutilation of the body and birth without sex. We can see these primal anxieties at work in de Corno's films. Following Justine, a lifelong vegetarian and vet student in her freshman year, Raw documents her gradual descent into cannibalism after she's forced to eat a piece of raw meat as part of an initiation ritual. This leads to the desecration of both her fellow students' bodies and her own. It's no coincidence that de Corno sets all of this against the backdrop of a vet school. She frequently shoots her actors as huge herds like cattle. Even before Justine's animalistic impulses are brought out, the human body is shown to be no less beastly than the creatures we eat, cut open and experiment on. Cannibalism as an analogy for the meat industry has previously been used in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where director Toby Hooper, who turned vegetarian as a result of making the film, has his villain Leatherface squealing and grunting like a pig before dining on human flesh with his incestuous family, all of whom have worked at the slaughterhouse. Where de Corno takes cannibalism as a symbol, however, is oddly liberating. In line with one of the most ubiquitous horror cliches, Justine as a female protagonist starts the film as a virgin, her sexual awakening occurs alongside the surfacing of her cannibalistic impulses, and her awareness of the human body as an object of desire grows in tandem with her awareness of it as an object for consumption. When she starts to lust after her roommate Adrian, the camera takes up her perspective as she leers over his body hungrily. This demonstrates a stark inversion of the male gaze, which is by no means exclusive to the horror genre, but is especially prevalent in ultra-violent films in which women are usually the victims. By flipping this convention, de Corno associates the objectification of someone from the opposite gender with the animalistic, taking the well-worn expression of treating women, or in this case men, like pieces of meat to the literal extreme. The scenes where Justine eats human flesh are by far the most disturbing of the film, especially as they come across as violations of her initial innocence as a vegetarian. The visceral reaction these scenes elicit, preview screenings infamously had several audience members fainting, calls upon the genre thrills of the 80s, and particularly the Hellraiser films with their exploration of sadomasochistic violence, as well as the extreme gore of more recent films like Martyrs and the work of Gaspar Noé. In contrast to these, however, Raw presents Justine's transgression and extreme awareness of the human body as the liberation of her true self from the constraints of her family and society. This is something de Corno calls emancipation through monstrosity. As with Midsommar, the source of horror is also a force for good in the life of the main character, despite its broader implications to the people around them. If Raw reverse engineers the animalization of the human body through horror to liberate its main character, then Titan develops this concept in relation to the mechanical. There's no getting around it. If you've heard anything about Titan, it's probably that in it, a woman f**ks a car. This strange attraction is apparently a result of a titanium plate she had inserted into her head following a car crash as a young girl, which itself seems to have been caused by neglect by her father. Alexia, now grown up, 
works as an erotic dancer at a motor show, moonlighting as a serial killer. As with Justine, violence for Alexia is inextricably bound up with her sexuality. After she's followed back to her car and aggressively propositioned by a fan, she brutally murders him. It's after this that she uh, lets off some steam in the passenger seat of the Cadillac she's just performed with. The erotics of cars isn't new to horror. David Cronenberg infamously adapted J.G. Ballard's book Crash into a controversial film in 1996, following a group of symphorophiliacs, people who get off by watching car crashes. It also evokes Stephen King's Christine, where a teenage boy's 1958 Plymouth Fury acquires a mind of its own, taking the spot of an obsessive, aggressive girlfriend. Once again, De Corno plays with the male gaze and takes this fetish to an uncanny extreme as Alexia claims the car as a sexual object for herself. Aside from the body horror relating to Alexia's violent crimes, the most striking elements of the film relate to the changes her own body undergoes. On the run after committing a brutal killing spree, Alexia changes her appearance by shaving her hair and breaking her nose to assume the identity of a missing boy. It's at this point that the film shifts her into a completely different emotional gear, as we follow her adoption by the boy's father, a firefighter called Vincent. As well as touching on themes of gender fluidity and bodily change, this decision allows De Corno to return to the theme of unconditional love that comes through in the dynamic of the cannibalistic family in Raw, as well as that offered by Justine's gay friend Adrian. As Alexia lives as Vincent's son, she grows increasingly pregnant, leaking engine oil and becoming covered in rashes and scratches. Returning to Frankenstein, we can see De Corno playing on the idea of unnatural birth, the creation of something not wholly human nor wholly artificial. Beyond just the implications of Alexia's impregnation by the car, there's the horror of pregnancy as she loses control over her own body. This has famously been explored in Rosemary's Baby, as the heroine is forced to carry and then mother the Antichrist, the perversion of her body being facilitated by the influence of her occult neighbours. While Rosemary's hellish pregnancy is suggested to be a punishment for her rejection of Catholicism, Alexia's motherhood is done on her own accord, a way of liberating herself from the expectations of society. The film ends with her dying in childbirth to what appears to be an infant version of herself, a literal act of self-creation as she emerges from her psychosis and trauma, having reclaimed the masculine aesthetic of sex and cars. In both films, sources of horror are also sources of personal growth, as both Justine and Alexia can shed their skin through embracing the monstrous. It's no coincidence that De Corno's debut short film, Junior, deals with shedding skin as a metaphor for adolescence and puberty. I always say that I consider my film themselves to be skins that I shed in order to uh, get to the next one to keep like the same obsessions and desires and fears also but to get deeper into that you know. From an outsider perspective what these characters do and what happens to them are objectively horrific providing proper genre thrills while De Corno's efforts to make us empathize with them reframe the monstrous as the liberating. To call her work elevated horror is to ignore the fundamental power behind all of the best ideas in horror which, when done well, can have a genuine emotional resonance. 